Hey, what's up YouTube? Short video today to talk about sphere tracing in Niagara, specifically for collision detection. Let's dive right in. So you're likely familiar with ray tracing and ray marching. With ray tracing, you define an origin and a direction, then query some kind of collision data or acceleration structure to check if there are any obstacles along the ray. Ray tracing on the GPU can be quite complex, and in Niagara, it's only available through hardware GPU ray tracing, which I believe is still considered experimental. Ray marching is similar, you also define an origin and a direction, but you also typically specify a step size and a number of steps to take. Starting from the origin, you take a sample, step forward in the specified direction, sample again to accumulate data, and repeat the process until you've taken all the steps or hit an early exit condition. It's commonly used for volumetric effects where you don't really know where objects or matter or whatever you're interested in are in space. It's almost like navigating blindly. You have to move forward cautiously one small step at a time. Sphere tracing works in a similar way, but it's used when you do know the distance to the nearest surface at any given point. And that's exactly what a distance field provides. For example, if you sample the distance field at the ray origin, and it returns 500 cm, you know you can safely move 500 cm in any direction without hitting anything. In the best or worst case scenario, you're heading directly towards the nearest surface, and you'll land exactly on it. So sphere tracing is a way to leverage distance fields to take adaptive steps, sometimes large, sometimes small, rather than cautious fixed size ones. It often results in better performance because fewer steps are needed. But the difference between sphere tracing and ray marching isn't just about performance. With ray marching, moving forward 200 cm is straightforward. You might just take 10 steps of 20 cm each. With sphere tracing, however, marching 200 cm could take a single large step or hundreds of tiny ones. There's no way to predict it, since the step size changes at every iteration based on the distance field. As always, I'm not here to say which method is better or more performant. They each serve different purposes. Anyway, let's take a look at how to implement sphere tracing in Niagara. Turns out, there's actually a built-in function for sphere tracing, but if you're not very familiar with HLSL, it might not make much sense, so I thought I'd rewrite it from scratch. As usual, the devil is in the details, and there's not one single implementation of sphere tracing. So knowing how to write the algorithm yourself lets you fine-tune those details and customize the behavior in case the default implementation does not suit your needs. So in a new emitter, let's create a new scratchpad module. Could it sphere trace or something? Now let's add an HLSL node. We'll be using the collision interface, so we need to create an input and connect it to the HLSL node. I like to prefix all my inputs with in. Now, right-clicking on the input pin allows me to copy the HLSL signature of all the functions exposed by this interface. Today, I'm specifically interested in this one. Since that's the only function we'll need, I'm jumping straight into Visual Studio Code for a better writing experience. Now, this function is only available in GPU emitters. So first, let's make sure we're running on the GPU with a simple if and an if. Our sphere tracing code will go in between. All right, let's think ahead and define all the variables we'll want to output from the HLSL node and initialize them, whether we are running on the GPU or CPU, meaning before the if statement. We'll want to know whether all the distance field queries were valid, if the sphere trace intersected anything, whether there was an initial overlap at the starting point, the position where the intersection occurred, the actual contact point on the surface, the distance traveled, the distance to the contact point, the gradient pointing to the contact point, which we can normalize to get a direction, and the surface normal at the contact point. Again, some of these outputs could be left out. That's the whole point of a custom implementation. You do you. 
Anyway, let's initialize them. By default, assume there's no intersection and no overlap. The intersection position will eventually be our trace end position, but initially it's the trace origin. This will be another input. We can set the heat position to the same as the intersection position for now. Distance traveled and distance to the surface both start at zero, and gradient and normal vectors can also be initialized to zero. Since we'll be sampling the global mesh distance field multiple times, I'm going to create a second boolean to temporarily store the validity of each individual query. But again, that's likely overkill. Whatever. I'll also need a variable to sanitize the step size. No big deal. Alright, time to start cooking. We sample the global mesh distance field at the current position and retrieve three things. The distance to the nearest surface, the gradient pointing towards the nearest surface, and whether the query was valid. If the query is valid, we continue. Now, if the distance to the nearest surface is already smaller than the radius of the sphere, that means we are already overlapping with something at the start position. Otherwise, we are good to go. We can march forward. So, this is an iterative approach, so we'll use a for loop with a fixed number of iterations. This will also be exposed as an input. Now, we may want to enforce a minimum step size to avoid extremely small movements. Next, we'll keep track of how far we've marched, and each iteration we move forward. So, the current position plus the normalized direction vector, another input, multiplied by the step size. At that new position, we sample the distance field again. If the query is valid, and all previous ones were valid as well, we continue, otherwise we exit early. And just like before, if the new distance to the surface is smaller than the sphere's radius, we've hit something. But this time it's not an initial overlap, but a regular intersection, so we can exit the loop. And that's one basic way to implement sphere tracing. Sample the distance field. Is the distance to the nearest surface too small to fit the sphere at that location? If so, that's an intersection. Otherwise, we march forward by that same distance and repeat the process until we either complete the loop or hit something. Quite simple, right? But let's go a bit further. If we detect a hit, we can compute the surface normal at that location. It's a bit obscure at first. It involves sampling the distance field in place, but with small offsets to the left, right, up, down, forward and backward. You take the difference in sampled distances across each axis to build a gradient vector, which you then normalize to get the surface normal. We can also compute the exact contact point on the surface like this, the position of the last distance field query minus the direction from the closest surface multiplied by the distance. Cool. Now we may also refine the heat position, because at this point the last position might be slightly penetrating the surface, or even be flushed against it, right? And to my knowledge, and I could be wrong, there's no simple math formula to fix that. It's not just a matter of stepping back by the penetration depth, because that only works if the contact point lies exactly along the right direction, otherwise you're out of luck, I think. However, we can perform a simple binary search. We know the previous position did not overlap anything, and we know the current one does. So the exact point where the sphere just touches the surface lies somewhere along that segment. So start at the midpoint and check the distance field again. If the distance is still less than the sphere radius, we are too deep so we move back. Else we move forward each time by half the remaining distance. Repeat this process iteratively until we converge to the right solution. In HLSL, it translates to this. Construct the segment from A to B, start at the midpoint, then iteratively sample the distance field at that location along the segment. Based on the result, move the next sample point either forward or backward along the segment. And with just a few iterations, you can converge on a reasonably accurate contact position. Again, you might not need to compute the exact sphere intersection position. It comes with a cost, and if all you care about is whether the sphere trace hits something or not, you can simply skip this part. Cool, so that's it for the algorithm. Let's copy and paste it back into Niagara and add the missing inputs, meaning any variable prefixed with in. In position, in direction, in width, in min step, 
in iterations, in binary search iterations. Let's create inputs for the module like this. And I'm simply going to get rid of the in prefix. I'll fast forward. We'll do the same for the outputs, those prefixed with out, out sphere position, out surface position, out distance to surface, out gradient to surface, out intersects, out surface normal, out distance traveled, out distance field valid, and out initial overlap. That should do it. Let's wire them up. Remove the out prefixes. And use either the transient or output namespace to expose them outside the module. Alright, time to give it a spin. Don't pay attention to the compilation errors for now. To keep things simple, I'll set the trace to start at the emitter's position, and the direction will follow the emitter's local x-axis. For the width, let's go with 100 cm, whatever. Min step 0.01, number of steps 4, binary search steps maybe 6. Of course, you can fine-tune these values based on your needs. Next, I'll create a single particle on spawn and make it last indefinitely. I'll switch the emitter to GPU, that's why the compiler was complaining, and enable fixed bounds. There are still some errors, so let's take a look. Hmm, in min step size should be named in min step. Also, let's enable binary search for now. Oh, a few more errors. Hmm, looks like the collision query interface is named incorrectly here. Better. Now, if you take a look at the sprite renderer, specifically the bindings, you'll see that a lot of these parameters are tied by default to what you'd expect, like rendering the sprite at the particle's position and so on. But these bindings can be overridden, which lets you draw all kinds of debug information. You can even use multiple sprite or mesh renderers, each bound to different parameters you want to visualize. Super useful. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'll set a new particle position parameter called trace end to store the sphere trace intersection position. Then I'll add a new linear color parameter called trace color. Let's make it green if there's an intersection, and red otherwise. Next, a vector 2D parameter called trace size, which I'll set to the trace width 100, multiplied by 2 since we want the diameter. Last step, assign these parameters to the sprite renderer. So position, hmm, sprite size, and color. I'll also need to assign a material, so let's create one and assign it. I'll fast forward through building the graph, since it's pretty straightforward and not really the focus of this video. I just want to draw the outline of a sphere. And if I didn't forget anything, this should work. Let's open a basic map. Add a cube, maybe scale it up a bit. And enable the global distance field debug view. And place the particle system in the scene. See, the trace is performed along the emitter's local x-axis. The sphere travels forward as far as the distance field allows it with just four steps and hits the cube along the way exactly as expected. Very cool. And that's pretty much it. This can be used to detect incoming obstacles per particle and so on. Alright, that's it for today's video, short and sweet. If you'd like to support my work and get access to a lot of cool educational projects, consider joining my Patreon. And huge thanks to my Patreon community for the ongoing support. I'll see you in the next video, take care of yourself, bye bye!